Welcome to Windows on the World. Join us live every Sunday, 8pm UK time, windowsontheworld.net and do check out the archive and program screen on the website. Welcome to this special from Windows on the World. Tonight we're going to be talking to a special guest, Judy Gregerson, and this show is going to be introduced by Jerry Marzinski. And I've done a lot of shows with Jerry over the years. If you don't know who he is, go to jerrymarzinski.com and also check out the homepage, Demons Are Real. Yes, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And that header on the homepage at Windows on the World, Demons Are Real, contains all of the shows that we've done on this subject. And for those people who are interested in this subject, you will also find solutions. So Judy's story is pretty scary, pretty tragic, but ultimately it's about overcoming these negative forces which can so easily take over people's lives. So hope you enjoy this interview and Jerry is going to start off this particular show. We're going to be talking about intrusive entities. We're going to be talking about what is broadly called schizophrenia. And before we talk to Judy, I'm going to bring Jerry in because he's going to introduce what we're going to be talking about. So Jerry. Okay, it's, it's shortly. I mean, you, you guys have seen me before. You've heard me before. But what I'd like to do is bring on people like, like Judy and Sherry and, and others who have experienced these psychiatric uh, hallucinations that they call them. Uh, psychiatry calls them auditory hallucinations. They're not hallucinations. And, and unless the people who are suffering from these voices understand that they're not hallucinations, these are entities. They, and if you can get rid of them by any means, all symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia disappear. So I've talked to you many times about these things. They're, they're invasive. They hit us all. Um, and I don't want you to just hear from me. I want you to hear from people like Judy and other guests that we bring on that give their story uh, about the voices. Th these are not hallucinations like the psychiatric mafia says they are. They're making $14.7 billion selling drugs for these, these to do something about the voices. They don't get rid of the voices. All they're doing is treating symptoms. Anybody who really wants to get rid of these voices needs to understand that they are not them. They don't come from them. They don't belong to them, that these are intrusive entities that are trying to take over the person's mind. Okay? Now, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to Judy and let her tell her story about how she viewed these voices. She has been through it. She has beat them and she's now back to normal. Okay, I'll tell, tell my story. I'll start with some background about me, about my family, what happened to me and, and why I was in a position for these to come at me and do what they did to me. I grew up in Long Island in kind of an idyllic family. My dad was a Navy pilot, he trained the Blue Angels. He was also a cover model. He was once the Dial Soap Man, if you remember the, the days of the Dial Soap Man. My mom was an artist. They were, they were wonderful people. We had a great family. And then the two of them started drinking. And they drank themselves into just a, a complete hell and destroyed our whole family. And fights went on night after night. They dragged out, you know, uh, for years, from the time I was eight years old till I was 13. My mom would drag my sister and I out of the house in the middle of the night to go find my dad. She nearly drove us into the bay a couple of times and killed us. And by the time I was 12, I was completely lost. I took a bottle of pills one night, didn't tell anybody, uh, woke up extremely sick the next day, just kind of lived, lived through that and got better. And when I was 13, my mother uh, positioned herself in a corner of the living room and drank herself into a stupor. And I think that had something not been done, she would have drank herself to death. She was at that point. So we were able to get my uncle, her brother, to come down and get her, and she was put into a psych ward to dry out. There was no treatment at that time for alcoholism, so they put her in a psych ward. And um, I was left with my father, who was neglectful. He, I was kind of a non-person to him. He was a narcissist, and uh, he, he didn't see me as a person. So. I was not allowed to feel anything negative. I was not allowed to talk about anything negative. I was not allowed to express emotion. So I had to repress everything that I felt. And I became very angry, uh, rebellious, promiscuous. Uh, and it, 
16, finally, when my father remarried, I slipped my wrists because I didn't want to live anymore. Nobody would talk to me. Nobody would help me. I was in a severe depression. And then finally, I got involved with an organized crime figure who um, was much older than me. I was about 17 at the time. And we would drink all night long and talk. And at one point, he got very drunk and tried to strangle me. And I kind of thought that was exciting, which is when I look back on it now, was really scary. So when I was involved with him, I was going off the next year to college, to a state college in New York. And he told me that my rooming assignment would be changed. My rooming assignment was on the lake. And he told me, and it was off the main, it was off to the side of the main campus. And he told me that it would be changed and I would be put in the middle of the main campus on a higher floor, not the first floor. And I said, why? He said, because it's harder to get somebody out of a third floor than it is to get them out of a first floor, which didn't make any sense to me. But I was offered a job to make phone calls and to relay messages for drug running. And I said, no, that I didn't want to do it. And so while I was at school that first year, well, first I found out when I got to school that yes, my dorm assignment had been changed. I was moved to the center of campus next to the administration building and I was on the third floor. I thought that was the end of it. My boyfriend moved to California. I thought it was the end of it. But then one of the people that he had worked with, one of his partners would show up. He would show up at places where I was. He would, and he would come over and he would say, be careful, be careful what you say. And I didn't know why they were following me. I didn't know it, but it terrified me. It absolutely terrified me. So I had a friend named Jim and Jim was very much into drugs and he got me involved with LSD. And I went off my freshman year into kind of an LSD uh, blaze. I mean, I did a lot of LSD. And after that, I began emotionally to fall apart. And I went through some rejection with some boys and um, slipped my wrists again my freshman year. In the campus um, administration, they made me see a counselor. He wanted me to talk about how I felt. I didn't know how to talk about how I felt because I'd never been allowed to feel. So I could not recognize uh, emotions. I couldn't recognize fear as fear. I didn't know what it was. It was just terror to me. I couldn't recognize anger. I didn't know what anger was. I didn't know it when I felt it. I didn't recognize any emotion. I was just kind of a blank and I was locked, locked inside myself. So he was very frustrated with me because I wouldn't talk, but I didn't, I didn't know how to talk about emotions. I didn't, I couldn't recognize them. So at the end of the school year came, I went home, I was working as a waitress and I started having dissociative episodes where all of a sudden I would just blank out. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, the world would become very quiet, time would stop, and then all of a sudden, boom, I'd snap back into reality. And I didn't know what that was about. I didn't realize I was snapping, I guess. So I went back to college. I decided no more LSD, uh, but I was smoking pot. And then another boy broke my heart. And so I took another bottle of pills. And while I took this bottle of pills, I, I knew, I knew after I took them and I was laying there, I knew that if I didn't do something, I knew I was going to die. And, and the sense came to me that if I died, I was going to go to hell. And that scared me, something terrible. So I picked up the phone and called somebody. And then I woke up in the hospital pulling tubes out of my throat. And then after that, I started feeling very strange, very not myself. And one night I was sitting in my dorm room, smoking pot and listening to Neil Young, laying on my bed. And I visualized, it was kind of a hallucination, I guess, a large wooden door in front of me, something you'd see in an old, old house, big, big wooden door, thick, heavy door. And it was calling to me. It was beckoning me to come. And I could feel it saying, come on, come through the door, come through the door. So I, in my mind, walked to the door, opened it. It was a very heavy door. I opened it and I looked inside. It was just kind of white light. And I thought, well, what's in here? And I'd, I'd been through, quote, portals when I was doing LSD. There were times when my girlfriends and I would see portals and we'd walk through them. So this wasn't anything unusual to me. So I walked through that door and when I shut it, the voices started and I was locked. I was imprisoned. I was, I was, I thought I was gone. So the voices began to, to talk to me. I was trapped. There was a tremendous amount of pressure. And then the voices began to torment me. And there were four of them. I named what did you, them. What did you think they were when they first showed up? I didn't know because I was stoned and I thought maybe they were just a hallucination. Um, 
but they kept up. And then, then when I sobered up, they weren't a hallucination anymore. I didn't know what they were. But uh, they started talking to me and they would argue. So I'd wake up in the morning and they'd say, well, good morning, Judy, one would say. And the other one would say, well, why are you talking to her? She's just a piece of junk. And then would say, oh, don't be mean to her. She's not a piece of junk. She's just crazy. And they would argue this all day about how nuts I was, how ruined I was, how destroyed I was, how worthless I was, and how my life was over. My life was just over. And they dominated me. And, um, and I'll tell you a little bit, too, about, about their act, how they acted in my life. And I'm, also, I'm reading from some notes here because I wrote a lot of stuff. I had to really think about it for, you know, for Mark. But they were telling me that I was worthless. I was useless. I was never going to be free. I was never going to be well. They wanted me to give up. They wanted me to kill myself. And they wanted me to do the world a favor and get lost. And from those voices, I began to buy into all that self, you know, self-rejection. I really began to hate myself because I thought, what is wrong with me? Where did this come from? I thought that my I thought that LSD had broken my mind. I thought my mind had snapped. And I didn't think I was ever coming back. And my mother had had a breakdown. So I figured, well, my mother cracked. So I guess I have to crack too. This is just genetic and I'm cracking up. And the doctor, you know, told the psychiatrist told me that that basically that I was mentally ill and I was schizophrenic and I would have to learn to live with it. And he gave me drugs and and now all they have for you, and I told Jerry this before, all they have for you is despair and drugs. So I took right. both. Very I hopeless message. Yeah. I, I took despair, I took the drugs. The thing that was very hard about it is there, it, when you're in that place where these things are on you and there's a presence, you can feel them on you. There's a heaviness. They, they press on you. It's an oppression as well as a, a mental um, craziness that goes on. But there's an aloneness. And, the, and you're in a place that you know you can't get out. You're trapped. It's a prison. And it's just filled with despair and emptiness, loneliness helplessness, and it's 24 hours a day, seven days a How'd week. How'd you feel it after you left on. the psychiatrist's office? When you, when you walked out of the psychiatrist's office, how did you feel? I actually felt better that I had a name to put on what I felt. I had a label. That label made me feel that, that I knew what I was, that I, was this, I had this broken mind and there was no fixing it. And at the same time, it made me feel completely... Um, it just filled me with despair because there was no there was no way back. The problem is you're in this box and you want to get out, but there's there's no way back. It's like if anybody's ever had a panic attack, it's like a 24-7 panic attack. There's no getting out. The world has ended. Your life has ended. And then there's a question of how am I going to live? How am I going to live? What, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? Am I going to work? Am I going to go in a psych hospital? And I had to go before a panel of psychiatrists to uh, for them to determine whether or not I need to go into a psych institute. And they decided that, no, I didn't have to go. I could stay outside, that I was at that point not a harm to myself, I guess. I don't know how they make that determination. <clears throat> but there's, there's also with it an ugliness and a filthiness. It's, there's something so dirty about it. You feel so dirty. You feel so ruined, wiped out. Um, and the and then then you take the drugs. I was on three drugs, two for my psychosis and one for side effects. And so you take the drugs, and then the drugs basically they're like they're like elephant tranquilizers. You know they yeah. they they numb you down, and so the voices weren't so loud. And like Jerry and I talked about, they kind of just kind of melded into my thoughts, and they more became impressions and emotions that I thought were my mo my own emotions. So they, they began to reside deep in me. So in a way, it was even worse. It was worse. And it was almost like it goes all the way down into your DNA. It absorbs. It, it absorbs your whole self, your whole body. It absorbs every part of your body. Every part of your flesh becomes a part of this, this mess you're in. It's not just in your head. It's your whole, it's your whole self. I don't know how to explain that. And um, the other thing is that when they, when these voices talk, you can't. I couldn't really hear 
much going on around me. They were so loud. Now I saw, I, was, I told Jerry about this too, that I saw a study that they did a study on schizophrenics brains and the auditory part of the brain is just on fire. It's just lit up. Yeah. And I said, well, I understand that because those voices light that area of brain up, but I couldn't, I could go like to the student union and people talk to me. I couldn't hear them. I could see their mouths. I couldn't hear them because this stuff is screaming in my head. So, you know, the, the drugs blurred, they blurred the voices. I, um, Sorry, Judy, I just wanted to make a point. Did that happen gradually, the isolation where you couldn't actually in the end hear what people were saying around you because it was so absorbed within yourself? Did that take a long time or did that come about quite quickly? It came really quickly. Once those voices started, there were times when they would yell at me and there were times when they would be quiet, but their presence was there. So their oppression, I could feel them, but they wouldn't speak. And so at those times I could hear, but when they started arguing and they would argue in my head, they, they, it almost reminded me how my parents would argue on and on and on and on, bicker, 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 bicker. And the bickering was over me. Um, and what a worthless, horrible human being I was and how I didn't deserve to live. And I really needed to off myself and do the world a favor. But it, it came on very quickly. It was just you know, that's what they're telling you is very common. I've speak, spoken to hundreds of schizophrenics where they say the same thing. You're stupid. You're worthless. You're no good. Uh, nobody likes you. You're, you're never going to amount to anything. Just go ahead and kill yourself and get it over with. I mean, it's like they're reading off of the same script. Hundreds of them, different patients. Mm -hmm. They all say the same thing. It's almost like they're all made into some giant cosmic cookie cutter and they go to the same demonic university. because It's the same lines over and over again. I think we discussed this before, Jerry, about them appearing to work in a system, a hierarchical system. Would you agree yes. with that, Judy? Yeah, they they are. I believe there are class of entities. I believe there are classes and levels of entities. I believe they have an organization that is very much like the Hindu system of gods. And they come to me. What I've seen experienced in my life, they come in clumps. They don't come. They generally don't come alone. I call them cousins. Uh, when I talk to people who are dealing with, not schizophrenia, but dealing with strong negative emotions and depression, um, they'll say to me, well, I feel helpless. And I'll say, well, you don't feel just helpless. You feel hopeless, helpless, and you probably have a side of despair. And they look at me and they go, how do you know? I said, because I, I know the clumps they come in. I know that how they travel in groups to people because I've seen it. Jerry, you probably see it. Mm -hmm. Too. They come, they come in groups, and there are certain groups that group together, maybe depending on what they feel can most easily tear somebody down and ruin them, because their their whole point is to ruin you until you're dead. That is the whole point. It's to, to kill, steal, and destroy you. Now, did really. you feel your energy disappear after the attacks? Did you feel like you had much less energy after they would attack you, or were they constant with you and always draining you? Um. The presence was always there. The presence never left. The voices came and went. Um, I was exhausted. I couldn't do my schoolwork. Yeah. I, I was so confused. Yeah. So confused. So they Try, were constantly draining you. They were constantly draining. I was in constant confusion. I was constantly trying to understand what, what was going on in my head. I was trying all the time to make sense of it, but it doesn't make sense. I mean, I, I grew up in a, in a horrible environment. I struggled with depression when I was 14, but I'm people who know me know I'm not a down person. So I did have self-esteem issues, but I was a pretty up personality. I wasn't, you know, some people just like being down. I wasn't one of those people. I never liked being down. I didn't like being depressed. I didn't like, I, I didn't like any negative emotional stuff, maybe because I grew up with so much of it. I still, to this day, can't stand negative emotional stuff. It just annoys, annoys me and bothers me. So uh, they they wore me out, I would say, methodically by their different ways that they worked on me. If it wasn't the voices, it was the oppression. And I don't know, Mark, if you've ever been spiritually oppressed by these things, but when they oppress you, they paralyze your mind. Yes, and, I've experienced it through other people as well with their entities attacking me. And I've spoken about this with Jerry, so I understand to a great extent what you're talking about. But I imagine the isolation must be terrible. And that is why 
we have this image of schizophrenics being complete loners and they seem to be in their own world. And I think that's an important point to bring up. It, would you agree with that, Judy? Is that how you felt? Yeah, they put you in, they put you in, I, I call it a prison. I mean, it was so much a prison to me that I painted bars, black bars on my window in my dorm room. I, I painted black bars on my door because I felt I was in a prison. I wasn't coming out. I mean, I would do things like that and my roommate would just go, <laughs> you know, she didn't know. And I said, I'm in a prison and I had to make it visible. I had to make it a visible prison because it was a prison. I couldn't, I couldn't get out of it. And one thing they do too is they isolate you. They, Judy, can you talk a little bit about how they did that with you? They, they don't want anybody else interfering with what they're doing. So, so they want you alone where they can work on you alone. Yeah, I, I found it very hard. The thing is, when you're in that state of mind, nobody gets it. Nobody gets it. Nobody understands what's going on. You're in a completely different world than everybody else. And the world is going on around you and you can't participate. Even if you talk to people and if you try to engage in doing things in your own head, you're not participating. You're in another world. So you're living, you're living in, in, in two worlds that are very parallel, but you're only really engaged in one and the other. It's almost like you're play acting. You're going through the motions, you're talking, you're doing what you're supposed to do, but you're not living in that world. That's not where your life is. Your life is in what's going on in your head and in this oppression. And so that's what's so isolating, Mark, is that you're not, you're not a, a participant in life. Life is over for you at this point. It's over. And now it's just a matter of how is it going to play out? How are you going to die? I mean, how is this going to end? That's really what it is. And I thought about that a lot. How is this going to end? Am I going to end it? Are they going to end it? What am I going to do? What am I going to be? Where am I going to go? Will I be able to work? And in the midst of this, my father, when all this was going down at college and he was informed by the psychiatrist and blah, 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 he calls me home to Long Island. I was in upstate New York. He called me home, took me out on his boat and told me to just stop it. Would you please just stop it? And if you can't stop it, don't come home. We don't want you. And so he cut me off. He thought I was just, and my stepmother convinced him that I was looking for attention. I could think of a lot better ways to get attention, but that's what they, that's, that's the game he played on me because he couldn't deal with anything. And I'm sure he felt responsible. He had had me evaluated when I was 16 by a psychiatrist who basically told him, if you don't help this girl, if you don't do something, there's not much hope for her. She needs help. He did nothing. He just said, oh, you know, don't be silly. You know, everything is small stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff. That was his answer to me as a kid. Well, so what, what, what would you have wanted him to do? I, wa I wanted him to recognize me as a person with feelings of my own, as a person of value. I was, I was invisible to him. In some ways, when I, when I was 13 years old, I used to take off for the weekend from Long Island to Philadelphia with my boyfriend, who was 32 years old, and I would disappear for a weekend. He would not even know I was gone. He had no clue because he wasn't he wasn't there. I didn't exist, you know, in my family. I was just I I I was just there, but I didn't exist. Nobody cared about how I felt. Nobody cared that I was sad. Nobody cared that I'd tried to commit suicide. They just covered it up. And I would have wanted him to, to love me enough. He didn't love me enough. He loved me, but he didn't love me enough. He loved himself more because everything was about him. Everything was about what he wanted. And how did you fare with a boyfriend while you were hearing these voices? How did they react to you having a boyfriend? They, they eventually all ran away. Boyfriends. They all I had one one boyfriend, when this all happened, he quit school and left. He just abandoned me. Um, the, were the voices telling you bad things about the boyfriends also? No, they did tell me to kill one of my friends. I was up in a dorm room one night up on the 10th floor. We were watching a movie in a lounge. There was a very heavy lamp there with a metal base. And my friend Jim, who'd gotten me into LSD, 
the voices told me that he was the one that had helped destroy my brain. He was responsible and I needed to kill him. And um, they told me to pick up that, that, that lamp and smash him over the head until he was dead. And fortunately, I, I had enough control. I had enough control and, and enough integrity, I guess, to realize that was really wrong. It's funny, though, because the psychiatrist when I went to me asked me one thing. Are you um, homicidal or are you suicidal? That's the first thing you want to know. And I thought, well, that's real interesting. That's all they care about. Yeah. Are you homicidal or oh, I got to kill a spider? Mm. Are you homicidal or are you suicidal? And I wasn't homicidal. I, 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 had, I was not somebody that wanted to hurt other people. I really cared about people. So, so at that point, um, getting back to kind of my life, I, I met a woman one day in the um, student union. She was a Christian. She was out evangelizing. And she preached the gospel to me, which made me so angry. It made me so angry. It enraged me. Yeah, the voices don't like that. They don't like that. She told me Jesus was real. He was alive. I could know him. I could be a Christian. I could go to heaven. I could confess my sins. And it enraged me so much. I was so nasty to her. She gave me her phone number. I went back to my room, and I just came to this realization that everything she had told me was true. I believed it. I said, I think it's true. So I called her up, and I gave my life to Christ at that point and became a Christian, and I got involved with the Christian community in my college. But in the Christian community, nobody had any answers. So how and, were the voices reacting to that? I don't think any differently, Jerry. I didn't take any flack. I took some flack from friends. That was that was during the Jesus movement and everybody, and I was a Jesus freak and we were handing out tracts on campus. And uh, I, I think they knew they couldn't, that it couldn't help me. You know, I was running around being a Jesus freak, but it had, it had no... It had no effect on my life. I mean, like a lot of people get converted to Christianity. They have a conversion experience. I didn't have one. I was the same the day before and the day after, except for now I had a Bible and I could read it. And I understood that Jesus loved me and he was alive, but I could not feel his love. I could not feel the power of God. Yeah. I, 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 it had no effect on me. And how were the voices point. reacting to all this? About the same. I did. They didn't hammer they didn't, on me about it. They didn't it. get louder. They didn't. They didn't try to discourage you. You know, I don't remember, Jerry. I don't remember that they did. They may have. I don't remember that, but I was convinced it was my answer, and I was determined to stick with it, wh wherever it took me. I figured well, it was good. maybe maybe it would take me somewhere. It wasn't taking me anywhere then. Nobody got it. The woman who had had helped me convert was convinced that I was just depressed. And so she began to teach me to have faith. And what were you thinking the voices were at this point? Did, I was still you... thinking they were me. And I was thinking that I was very broken. And I was trying to figure out if God could heal me and fix my brain. And, uh, and like I said, I was thinking maybe this will lead somewhere because I got, I mean, I'd gotten to the point where I couldn't find anything that worked that could fix me. And probably, Jerry, you see this with people you deal with. You, you go through your head all the things that might help you. You think about all the people that might help you. And then you realize there's, there's nothing. There is, there is no help. You are there alone. So this was like a lifeline. This woman, this Christian woman, she was full of faith. She was full of love. She just loved me like a mother. She mothered me. She gave me all the love my mother never gave me. The community, uh, she lived in, in Syracuse. I was upstate above her in Oswego. I would go visit her. It was 50 miles away. And I would go to her community, and they would love me. And they would take me in, and they would pray for me. And sometimes when I was with her, all of it would leave. The presence would leave. The voices would leave. And so I knew I knew there was something there, but I didn't know what it was. I thought it was her. I thought it was her. Uh, I didn't understand the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit at that point. So I just kept going. So eventually, you know, I flunked out of college because I couldn't do my schoolwork. They, they asked me to leave, which is probably a good thing. And I was living in the sorority that I was a part of. And 
I had nowhere to go. I went for a couple of weeks down to Fort Dix to stay with my sister, whose husband was a, he was a um, helicopter pilot in the Vietnam War. I stayed with her for two weeks because I thought that would fix me. And I was at that point doing things that I thought, you know, I thought moving would fix me. You know, if I move, that'll fix me. When I get to New Jersey, I won't feel this way. And I got to New Jersey and I felt that way. So then I moved back up to my sorority house. And then I realized there's nothing that's going to fix me. So I have to kill myself. So I went out to my car one night and took a, a hose and cut a hose and, and put it in my tailpipe and my little VW bug and put the hose in the window and closed the window up and started the car. And I figured there's no way out. I'm never getting out of this. I'm never getting out of this prison. So I, I've got to get out of here. It was the only way because, because you're living in constant, it's torment. Fear is torment and schizophrenia. I would say the major entity is fear, fear. And that paranoia, you know, something's coming to get you. Something's going to destroy you. And so I rolled up the window and turned the car on and prepared to die. And a friend of mine, uh, for some reason, she sensed something was wrong. I don't know how. She didn't see me leave the house. She came out and pulled me out of the car. So I went after that to my psychiatrist. And I said, if you don't do something to help me, I'm, I'm going to kill myself. And he said, what do you want me to do? And I said, I want to go to Syracuse. I'd heard about this secretarial school. And I thought, I'll go get some skills. So at least I can work. And I said, so if you don't, if you don't help me, I'm, I'm going to die. So he, he was a good guy. He said, okay, he got me on disability and set me up and got me in this school. And then my Christian friend in Syracuse found a house with a bunch of Christian girls from Syracuse University that I could live with. And so I went there and I went to that school and basically flunked out of that. But I was a really good typist. I could type about 120 words a minute accurately. So I, they got me a job at a local newspaper typing computer, put, typing computer codes is when they were going to computer type, typing all the news stories into computer codes. And there was a Methodist church there, kind of a charismatic Methodist church at the time. I started going, going to church there, but still nothing changed. I was still in my, in my prison. And... Um, were you so on then, psychiatric drugs at this time? I was on psychiatric drugs at this time, and I, I was so Jerry. I was so, I was so defeated. I mean, I would get up, I would go to work, I would come home, listen to music till two o'clock in the morning. I'd go to sleep, I'd get up, I'd go to work. That was my life. I had no friends. I had nowhere to go. I had nothing to do. The only thing I did do was go to church on Sunday, but I, I decided that. What I really need to do was sign myself into a hospital. And there was a psychiatric hospital. It was upstate medical center had a, a psychiatric hospital. I think it was called Hutchinson. So I went and knocked on the door and I said, hello, I, I'd like to sign in. And they said, well, you really can't sign yourself in. And I said, well, then I want counseling. I want somebody to help me. And they asked me what was wrong. And I told them and they said, well, we don't do out treatment. It's only in treatment and you can't come in just by knocking on the door. I don't remember how they said I could get in, but they seemed to indicate that I couldn't come in. And then the psychiatrist talked to me a little bit. He took me in and talked to me. He says, well, I'll tell you what. He says, I don't, I'm not allowed to do this, but I'll do this. I'll see you three times a week. And I thought, wow, okay. And I was still on the drugs. So I went to see him and then he said, well, I've assigned you to a counselor. He signed me to this guy. He was a, a young counselor out of college. He was a Catholic guy. And he was assigned to me and I began to see him three times a week. And I was still on the drugs. And he was convinced that my biggest problem was that I was full of sin, basically. So he told me I was full of anger and resentment and bitterness. And I was. I was filled with all that stuff. So he began to help me explore, go back and explore my life and where all this, well, everything that had happened with the family, my anger at my mother, my resentment, at my father, and on and on and on. And I spent six months with him crying, three, three days a week, crying this stuff out, crying all this trauma out, or some layer of it anyway. And um, I began to feel better and the voices began to get less because I began to get strength and believe that I was somebody I began to believe that I had some value again, which I didn't believe before. That was a big, big boost for me. And then around that time, after I'd been through that a couple of months with him, I was at church one day and this, this uh, woman evangelist from Philadelphia, Evelyn Carter came. I didn't know at the time that she, she was very well known. 
And she had a ministry of deliverance, basically, getting people free from this stuff. I didn't know that. She never said that, that I remember. But I remember sitting in church and thinking, I need to talk to her. She's she's my she's my help. So I called one of the elders who I knew well, and I said, I'd like to talk to her. And they said, well, come on over. So I drove over. And I sat down with her, and I started telling her my story and about the voices and the presences. And she let me talk for about two minutes, and then she just went, stop. And she said, let me tell you what it is. She said, that's the enemy. That's Satan, and that's Satan's demons. And you're dealing with spiritual warfare. You're a Christian. They have no power over you. And she handed me a little book called the Jesus Pocket Promise Book. And she said, every time they come and they bother you, you read scripture to them out loud. And that book's divided up into sections like, do you have fears? Do you have worries? Do you have anxiety? Do you, do you need, this? are you sick? She said, just find whatever applies to your situation, whatever you're feeling, and you read it out loud. And I thought, oh my gosh. It was like the craziest thing I ever heard. It was like, this was like, great, the magic wand. She's given me the magic wand. And I'm like, I, I, I didn't believe it, but I thought, well, you know what? Nobody else has told me that this anything works, so I'll try this. Now, Judy, so thought, we're, when she said they were they were Satan, mm -hmm. how, how, what were you thinking? What, what was going through your head when she said that? Well, you know, I'd read enough of the Bible to know that there is a Satan and to know who he is and how he acts and what he does. I knew that much. So it, for me, it was a connection. But is that where it clicked? Is that where you you went, okay, that, where, I know what these things are? That's where it clicked for me in the sense that this this might be my out. This might be it. I've got, you know, I knew I had to walk this path for a while. I had to prove it out. I had to test it. And I had at that point worked out enough of my anger and resentment and bitterness that those emotions I'd unloaded. So I wasn't carrying that anymore. So the voices weren't, the voices weren't as bad, but the oppression, the, the feeling, the, the pressure, the, that was always there. So I took this little book and, I, and she said, just, just try it, try it. And you write me, let me know how it goes. So I took the little book and I was working on the copy desk at the Syracuse Post Standard. Uh, and I was training to be a copy editor and I was still doing all the typing. And I would sit there and this fear would come over me and anxiety. I mean, it would be like a, like a panic attack it would come and the pressure and, the, and then your brain is paralyzed and you can't think, you go completely blank. So I took this little book out of my purse and I ran to the bathroom and locked myself in a stall and I opened up to fear and I started reading the scriptures. And she told me also to say, in the name of Jesus, you have to go. You have no power, no authority over me. I command you to leave me in the name of Jesus because his word says, and then I'd read the word out loud. And I did that and immediately like that, boom, the pressure left, the presence left, the fear left. And for the first time in almost four years, I was clear. I was me. I was me again. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I found my door. I found my door. This is it. And then I realized these are demons. They're demons. And as I read more in the Bible, I realized they come to kill, steal, and destroy. And they had come to kill, steal, and destroy me. And I mean, I was like right, right pickings. I was weak. You know, I had bad self-esteem. I had all kinds of open doors. And they just walked right in. And then I walked through their door and I let them in. And um, so I did that for Jerry about, um, well, it was a couple of months, probably from January, February till about April. And then my counselor told me, it's time for you to get off the drugs. And I was terrified, terrified, because I thought, OK, I'll get off the drugs. But if I get off the drugs, I'm going to go through withdrawal. Or these voices are going to come back, and I'm and I'm. I, I was confused. I didn't know what was going to happen. What was going to happen to me? What was going to be the result? And so I got off the drugs, and I went through a terrible withdrawal, of probably about three days, sweating and shaking and tremendous fear. It was a horrible, horrible experience. And then on Easter morning, it was 1974. I woke up after three days of that, and it was all gone. The drugs were gone, the demons were gone. I was back. I was back to normal. I was me. I was me again. And then, and then 
that wooden door that you talked about walking through. Yeah. What was your reaction when they started calling you to go through that door? I mean, what did you think that door was? Was there any ominous feeling to it? What? No. I thought it was going to be a big, big surprise in my being stoned. It was going to be something that was going to feel really good. You know, I was listening to Neil Young, and I really loved Neil Young. And, you know, he, he could get you really good and depressed if you listened to him too long. And I was into kind of a melancholy state. And I was just kind of going with it. I was like, oh, this is the next thing. I go through the door and and some something new will happen with this high that I'm on. But no, no, there was no warning that there was anything bad there. And once, like, you walked hey. through, once you walked through the door, what happened? The door slammed shut. It slammed shut. And then the so voice was the consent that they needed, really. Yeah. And when that door slammed shut, I was a prisoner. There was no getting out. Yeah. That's when they took, I actually believe, and I didn't, I didn't think this for many years, but when I think back, I actually believe that I was possessed by four demons. I actually believe it because they ran my life. It, it was, it was their life. You know, they ran everything. I didn't run anything. You know, when they didn't want me to do something, they could stop. <laughs> they didn't want me to do something. They just fill me with fear and I would stop dead. I'd paralyze. They could paralyze me. You know, I was like I was like a puppet, and they could they could engineer what I did and where I went, and what I didn't do. And so when that door shut, it was over. My life was over. I was I was captured, and I was gonna I was gonna as far as I knew I was gonna be there forever. And I called my roommate and I told her at the time I I can't get out. I'm trapped. I can't get out. And she said, "Where are you?" I said, "I don't know where I am, but I can't get out." And they even sent an administrator over. You know. From the, from the college, and and I got to know her. Her name was Linda, and I got to know her real well. And I think they'd sent her to, to make sure that I wasn't going to hurt anybody or myself. And she kept saying, well, what's going on? I said, I'm trapped. I can't get out. And, she's, and she said to me, where are you? I said, I don't know. I don't know where I am, but I'm not here. I'm not here. And they didn't understand that, that, yeah, I was there, but I wasn't there. And maybe, Jerry, you understand that, that living in that living in parallel worlds where you're really not living in the real world. You're living in the world of your tormentors, but you're present in the world and you can talk and you can engage, but you're not living there because life, so much of life is in your mind. You know, it's in your mind. It's what you see. It's what you think. And so, uh, you know, I, I lived, I lived in that world and there was, there was no, no getting out. There was no getting out. But the thing was, after finally I got out, Mark, I still fought and battled for a while with those things because they would come and try, but I knew how to fight them. Now I had a weapon. That must be quite a revelation that when you get that fear, you know how to counteract it. Yeah, you do. And the thing was that once I was able to overcome them, the battle then became, and Jerry will understand this, the battle then became dealing with my trauma and my triggers and a lot of triggers and they could trigger me and then off I'd go. And then I'd have to fight the battle with scripture to get back and to get rid of them. But they trigger my own emotional triggers and then I'd be left in that emotional kind of mess. So my life work became getting over my triggers. And Jerry and I have talked a lot about the mace mes method. This was back in the mid seventies. There was no mace method then. There was no, that I knew of no trauma. I didn't trust anybody after being in that psychiatric community and being on drugs. I decided I would never trust the psychiatric community again. In fact, I decided I would never trust the medical community again because I realized this is a game and I'm, I'm, I am the, um, I'm the guinea pig. Journey, did, we, did, did, did we run a base session on you? or, or I don't remember. Yeah, we did. How'd, yeah, that work, did. how'd that work for you? Well, you know, I was thinking about that, and I realized that I haven't really had any triggers since then. I've worked a lot. Though. I mean, I've spent my life getting rid of the triggers, and it's interest, it's been interesting to me, and you probably see this, Jerry, in your work. It's been interesting to me how deep 
and broad the triggers can be when you've been yes. traumatized. Deep and broad. So you go a layer and you, and you wipe those out. And then you feel pretty good for all. Then you go a layer and you wipe those out. And that's what I've spent my life doing. And I have a, I have a guy here locally who will pray with me. He's a deliverance minister and he will pray to remove those triggers and to remove those, the things that are spiritually associated with them, the, the, the spiritual entities that have attached themselves to those triggers that work when those triggers trigger. And a lot of it goes back a long way. And, and it's amazing how deep it is. I'm at the point now in my life where there's not much that triggers me anymore. I, I used to have tremendous triggers. I, I, I couldn't go into groups of people I, I couldn't I couldn't hear a loud noise for years. If I went into a group of people and there was a loud noise, I would freak. I could not take the loud noise. I don't know why, but it would it just completely freaked me out. And I would get totally weird. My friends think, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I can't take it. I can't take the noise. So so you know, so I battled this, but not they have not overcome me. I think we all do with it. I think probably Jerry, you do. I think everybody I know deals with this. I, I work with women who deal all the time with this negative stuff. They come wherever somebody's weak, it seems, and they work on that weakness, try to, to try to knock them down. And um, so, you know, to, to me, it's just uh, Christian spiritual warfare now for me, which is for every Christian, it's a normal part of life. We have an enemy, you know, he hates Christ. And he wants to tear down everything that is that belongs to Christ, and and we fight him. And that's and, that's where psychiatry becomes so dangerous because they make you believe that this is a physical uh, problem due to a, a biological imbalance in your brain, which there is no evidence for whatsoever. They don't talk anything about spirituality, and neither does psychology. Both of them are spiritually devoid. And we're spiritual beings, and these are taxed by spiritual beings that don't exist in, in 3D reality. There's no time, space, or matter where they're at. So no matter where you go, they, they, can, they can be there. You can go under the ocean. You can move across the United States to the other side mm -hmm. of the world. They're still there. You know, pouring physical drugs on a spiritual entity is like pouring Thorazine on a magnetic field. It does not get rid of it. These are not physical entities. They, all those drugs do is just drug your mind. They're, they're major tranquilizers, like Mark was saying. They just dumb you down. They treat the symptoms, but they don't get anywhere near the cause. And they're not going to until they realize this is a spiritual battle, just like you were saying. This has got nothing to do with, with uh, a physical problem that you have. Well, here's, here's the interesting thing. When I, the first time, stood up to them with the scriptures and spoke to them, and when they left, here's the part that blew my mind. I wasn't broken. I was normal. I was like I was before all that happened. I was me. Again, my brain, there was nothing wrong with my brain. Did you feel I'm, fully integrated again? Yeah, completely. Kind of intrusionless, because that's what's coming across when you're speaking about it. It's like a major spiritual victory, which is apparent. And it must have been re a real revelation. And it's happened within your own lifetime. I'll, t I'll tell you a story. I was working at, at the newspaper and it, we worked from 2 to 11. And at that time I was going through counseling and I was praying and I was asking God, please heal me. Please heal me. Whatever it takes, please heal me. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Please heal me. I was walking from the from the newspaper to the bus stop because my car had broken down. And I was singing a song called Oh Happy Day. It was it was a gospel song at the time. It was, it was a happy song. And in a in a moment's time, all the stuff lifted from me as I was singing. And I heard God say to me, I will heal you. And in that moment, I was free. And I was free from the time I walked from the newspaper till I got to the bus stop, and then it was all back. And I felt like it was God saying to me, you're going the right way. I'm going to, I'm going to, he showed me that I was okay, that I was intact, and that he was going to heal me. And I was allowed to feel that. And I was perfectly well, there was no sickness in me. There was no, my mind was not shattered, which it was very shattered under these demonic entities. 
my mind was very shattered. They shattered it. Um, but once they were gone, all that left. And I was I perfectly normal. I keep repeating over and over again, if you can get rid of the voices by any means, people return to normal. Yeah, you know? perfectly normal. So, so it's, the voices, it's the voices that cause paranoid schizophrenia. It's not any genetic anything. It's not a biochemical imbalance. It's not anything physically wrong. This is a spiritual battle. And mm -hmm. unless they realize this, they're never going to get a cure. And they don't want a cure because they're making so much money selling these you know, toxic antipsychotic drugs. I think that's the whole purpose of what's going on at the moment, really. And this fork in the road that's become very apparent even over the past five years, it seems to be separating people from things which are of no use to them. And I think it's a very positive thing. So this parallel world of psychiatry and the real cause of schizophrenia is something that people who are looking for can find. And I think that's the most encouraging thing out of all the interviews we've done, that people will maybe latch onto this and realize what it truly is, because the whole of the system is there to gaslight our reality. Yes. Because otherwise material atheism cannot work and the system therefore cannot work so that what I, that's what i think is quite revolutionary about this whole thing it's one of the most important things that anyone could ever realize and the perfection of your own mind and the realization of your connection to divinity is of course what what they're a system of governance would try and interrupt. And it makes perfect sense when you think about it. Yeah, yeah the, the, the drug companies are making $14.7 billion, a billion, not million, billion dollars a year selling these toxic antipsychotic drugs that destroy your brain. They actually rot out your brain with long-term use. So they're, they're doing they're doing more more damage than they are good. And, and like Mark was saying, you, you it, it's good to use them temporarily, but not as a lifetime sentence. I mean, yeah, of course they have their place, don't they? When when someone is have psychotic and out of control, they have to be sedated because yes. obviously they're they're such a danger to themselves and everybody else. And I've seen that. And psychosis is a very frightening thing. So they do have a use. And this this is the point that the delineation has to be made of when someone's having a psychotic episode or they're under spiritual attack. And of course, the, the, st the state and the system, as we've said, would never recognize that. No. And it can't and, recognize that. And, and there's lots of schizophrenics who commit murders or crimes. They go to court and they say, I, I just don't remember doing it because they didn't do it. It was the voices who did it. Of mm -hmm. course, the judge isn't going to believe that. So they lock up the voices and the, and the patient also. You know, I went back... Um... Oh, I'm trying to think when. I went back to visit my psychiatrist, the first one I saw, when I got married to my second husband. So it had to have been after 85. And I found him, and he was shocked to see me. And he went looking for my file, but they'd moved the county mental health center, so the files were, there were no more files. But he remembered me, and we talked, and he was shocked. He said, you don't believe he it. He didn't believe it. He said, you're not taking any drugs. I said, no, I'm not taking any drugs. Well, how did you do it? Well, I was scared to death to tell him how I did it because I thought he'd think I was crazy. So I thought, well, I'm not going to tell him how I did it. <laughs> what did you tell him? Well, that's part of the problem, no, isn't I, it? You get the I solution told, and you can't tell anybody. <laughs> I couldn't tell him because he'd think I was crazy. So, so I said to him, well, I found a counselor who counseled me three times a week and we worked out all all this trauma from my childhood and I cried for six months, you know, three times a week. I'd go to I'd go to work with bloodshot eyes. I look like hell, you know, that six months or four months, whatever it was. And that's why I told him because I couldn't tell him no. that it was demons. No. I couldn't tell him that. But he said to me, he said to me, well, okay, you're married. He said, do you have children? I did. I had, I think I had one daughter at that time. And he said to me, well, the real test, he said, the real test, I found this really interesting. The real test of whether or not you've overcome and you're healthy is if you can raise your own family. 
And I said, well, I am. I, I have a good marriage, a healthy marriage, and I'm raising a child. And he was stunned. And he remembered me. And he said, well, I remember you used to play games with me. I said, what do you mean you used to play games with me? He said, well, you come in and you tell me things like, you know, I was thinking the other day, and, and I really would think these things. He said, you come in and you tell me, I was thinking the other day that if I went to the dining hall and ate by the plate glass window that a Boeing airplane was going to come fly and land and put its nose through the glass, because I would have thoughts like that, would make, which would make me afraid to go to the dining hall. He said, you were playing games with me. He said, you told me one time that if you ate something, a roll or something, that, that the dorm was going to blow up. I mean, this is the kind of crazy stuff these, these things would tell me. So I would tell him that stuff, and he, he, he claimed, you know, that many years later, 15, 18 years later, that I was, that I was playing games. And I thought, that's interesting. He thought that was games. They have no understanding of the voices at all. They don't stop and ask the patient, what are these things telling you? How do they behave? What do they do? You know, what, what patterns are they running? They're totally convinced in medical school that there are hallucinations because that's what the psychiatric mafia has adopted and proclaimed. And, and they're still teaching that in medical school, that these things are, are auditory hallucinations. Yeah. Well, there was well, in so a way, they can't, they can't stop teaching it, can they? They've established their system, and they can't stop teaching that. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 yeah but, it, it, but that's a hopeless system. I mean, it, it's just a hopeless system. It, they're, telling, they're telling the patient, your brain is broken. There's nothing you can do about it except take our toxic drugs and visit us every two weeks to get your prescriptions refilled for the rest of your life. It's a well, very of course, it depends message. on the state and the pharmaceutical companies, which is obviously the purpose of it. So the purpose of the system is to make people dependent on it. Yes. And that it's is the create, whole idea of the, the global system at the moment. It's to create a corral of sick people that are a repeat, repeat customers. Yes. I had a friend who had a mental illness. He was, I think he was, I don't know what he was. He had all kinds of problems. And he used to go to the local NAMI. Is it NAMI? National Association. Yeah. He would go to their meetings. And, and the, the head psychiatrist of NAMI would be there. And the head psychiatrist got up one time talking to the group. And he said, he said, said to them, well, you know, we know. We know these drugs kill 30 to 35% of the people who take them with heart yeah. attacks and strokes. We know they kill. And somebody said, well, why are you giving to him? He said, because it's the best answer we have to control the population. That's what yeah. he said. It's all about oh, population boy. control. Yeah. Yes. It's about controlling the population. When I Our lived management, in New of course. Yeah. yeah. When I lived in New York City in the mid-late 70s, that, well, that was the time when they were emptying the, the psychiatric institutions and they dumped thousands upon thousands of them. Yes, all over the United States. Yes. And they and ended they up in the prisons. Yeah, and they put them in SROs, which were single room, room occupancy hotels. They were old, beat down, condemned buildings almost. They drugged them and that's how they controlled them. They kept them on drugs. They took them out of the institutions. They put them in the hotels. So you'd walk down the streets of New York and you'd be like in the east side in the 70s, which is a beautiful area. And you'd hit a block where there'd be like 20 of these zombies standing on the road. You didn't know if they were going to attack you or what they were going to do. And you'd have to make your way around them. And they were, there were clumps of them all over the city, you know, and, and that's how they corralled them. It's a corral system. It's a control system. You know, I was working in the state hospital when that proposition, what was it? What are proposition, what's 71 or whatever. It started in California as a, real estate rebellion to the high taxes that people were paying. And then it spread all over the United States. And I remember them giving us lectures saying, well, this is better for them to be out in the community around more normal people, you know, and, 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 and we're setting up all these mental health centers all over to handle these people. But they wouldn't take those drugs even when they were handed to them at the state hospital. They would spit them out in the trash can when nobody was looking or they'd spit them in the toilet. Mm -hmm. I remember one time where I was on the first floor of a psychiatric unit and here was a maintenance man had a, uh, a, a saw and he was cutting off the bottom end of a banister. 
it was like a pipe banister that ran up to the second floor. There was no, uh, no steel cap at the top of the second floor. So it was a hollow pipe that went all the way down to the first floor. And there was nothing better going on at the time. So there was a bunch of patients standing there watching the sparks fly in the smoke. And I just snuggled in there with them. And I was watching the fireworks also. When that cap fell off of that stairwell, thousands of pills came pouring out of there. It was like a, a waterfall of all these multicolored pills. <laughs> thousands of them just went all over the floor. You know, it was like decades they had been throwing those medications in down that banister. And I started looking at these meds and a lot of them were antipsychotic drugs. And I'm going, why are they choosing to remain insane? And why aren't they taking these drugs? Well, the problem with the drugs is that they steal your soul. You know, well, the demons, these entities, they, they take your personality. They take over your life. That's why I think I was I was possessed because it wasn't my life anymore. It was theirs to live. And I was just something. I was like a, a little toy car that they moved around on their little chessboard. You know, and they played with me and toyed with me. So I didn't own my life. But the drugs on top of it, they steal your soul. There's nothing. What What's left is it takes the rest of it. Yeah. And you yeah. become... A numbed out zombie blob. You know, you gain weight, you're constipated constantly. You, you, I mean, the first two weeks I took them, they made me nearly blind. I, the life, you know, was a blur for two weeks. I couldn't hardly leave my room because I couldn't, couldn't see to walk. They're like, oh, it'll pass. You know, they gave me a pill yeah. for something. Yeah, I remember. I remember him telling that to patients. Oh, it'll just blur your vision for a while. You, you know, mm -hmm. you, you'll you'll be sleepy. You, you know, that some of these frontline symptoms. You know, they never mentioned the the permanent damage these things do to your brain and your peripheral nervous system with long term use. Mm -hmm. So they would just say, "Oh yeah, just expect that stuff." And one thing I found strange was psychiatrists were being assaulted by schizophrenics at a horrendous rate at the state hospital where I was working. And they were only seeing patients for 15, 20 minutes a, a month. And I'm going, what are they saying to these guys where they're getting assaulted at that rate when they're only seeing them for 15 or 20 minutes a month? The assault rate was almost equal to the assault rate of, um, what do they call them? The, the, the people who are on the wards all the time, the orderlies. Mm -hmm. you know? They're there all the time. And the salt rate for the psychiatrists are only seeing them 15, 20 minutes a month. They were almost equal. Mm -hmm. I never could figure that out. At the end of seven years, I had one patient who stopped taking her drugs. She was about to be discharged from the program. And her mother came up and we're, we're asking her, you were doing good. You were about to graduate as a cosmetologist. Why did you stop taking your drugs and go crazy? She said, well, you won't believe me if I told you. That, I said, tell me. You know, I've heard a lot of weird things since I've been here. I don't think you're going to shock me with anything. She said, the voices told me that the psychiatrist was poisoning me and pointed to these psychiatric symptoms, the, the side effects, the toxic mm -hmm. side effects, and said, here's the proof that, you're, that they were poisoning you. That explained the assault on the, those psychiatrists, the voices mm -hmm. telling them, you're being poisoned, and they are in it. They, they are indeed being poisoned. Those are the toxic side effects of these toxic drugs. I met a psychologist at NYU when I lived in New York City, and told him some of my experience. And he asked me what drugs I was on, and I told him, and he said, "You have no permanent side effects." And I said, "Not that I know of." And he goes, "Oh my God, you are so lucky." He yeah. said, "You are so lucky." He said, "You should at least have what dys dyskinesia." So just yeah. your arms flying in the air. He said, "You should at least have that." And I said, "No, I don't. I don't have any side effects." And I, and, and you know, the thing is, though, they did not give me informed consent. There was no informed consent. I, they did not tell me what the side effects were. And no, I realized they, they never do. And I realized after a while, you know, Mark, I realized that I was just a guinea pig. That they were collecting their statistics. Out of the county mental health system, I figured this out. I'm pretty smart. I thought, oh, this is just a game. They're collecting statistics. They're reporting back, you know, to the drug companies or whatever, or to to whoever. And I'm just a, a pawn in this game. They're just using exactly. Me. And I think your story proves that you don't have to be. And that is 
a great revelation. What would you say to people who are suffering from voices and want to make a breakthrough but are having difficulty? What would you say to them, Judy? I, I would strongly recommend that they grab on to Christ yeah. and his power and give their lives to Christ and allow him to give them the power and the Holy Spirit to battle this. Now, I understand there are people who have overcome them who have not become Christians. That was a shock to me. I heard it from Jerry and I heard it on another podcast the other night from a, a guy who was a former Satanist. And he talked about people getting free of this stuff without the power of Christ. I, I didn't know that you could, but apparently you can. Yeah, it's unusual. But, yeah, but I would recommend that people give their life to Christ, uh, repent of their sins, get this, get the junk in them cleaned out. The stuff that these things feed on, they feed, they feed on sin. Things like bottled up anger and resentment and 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 uh, hatred. I had, I had so much hatred in my life, and that was an open door for them. All those things are open doors. It makes you. A prey, and you don't even know it. Yeah, it the Mace you... Energy method is good about getting rid of that buried stuff in your in your in your mind that you're you're, you're no longer aware of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can find out more about that on my website at jerrymarzinski.com. Yeah. It works better than these pills that the psychiatrists are giving, and there's permanent results. That's yeah, right, they... Jerry and Ju Judy. I think we could actually finish there because. The points have been made perfectly. I think your last statement completely summed up the purpose of this show. And if there's anything else you want to say in the last few minutes, um, just carry on. Well, I, I would also recommend, Mark, for anybody who's going through this and trying to come out of it, that they find a community of people, whether online, um, whether locally, who understand this stuff. There are groups of people who do. They, um, I'm not a, a huge fan of deliverance ministries in the sense that you get delivered once and for all and you're free. This is a lifelong battle. These things fight you. I mean, I, I went through a battle, two big battles since I got well that took a, some time in my life where they came again to get me. They came to destroy me, but I knew they couldn't. And so I didn't fall prey to it. And I just had to battle it out every day. I had to battle the thoughts. I had to battle the presence. I had to command it to go. I had to get people to pray with me. But I'd encourage people, get involved in a community of people who understand this and who can help you day to day and find somebody like Jerry, you know, where you can, you can do the MACE method and get rid of this trauma so that at least you don't have the trauma and the triggers for these things to feed on because they... I think they go looking for people. Yeah, that's, their, that's their food. It seems to be what it's happens from all the people we've talked to and from the things that I've observed. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. And, and you know, I see it on less of a level than, than Jerry does with the women that I work with. They're not psychotic, but they are seriously oppressed. And, and all of them have some type of trauma. And after trauma, this stuff comes looking for them. It yeah. just comes looking for them, and it finds them, and then they, they get trapped. Yeah, they're you know, like and sharks in the ocean smelling blood. They go yeah. after the wounded. Yeah. And so, you know, we have to we have to use all the weapons that, that we've been given. You know, Christ gave us a lot of weapons. He gave us our faith. He gave us truth. You know, when I, when I learned the truth that I was okay, you, you don't know what a revelation that was. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm okay. It was like... Wow, I'm okay. After See, that, fly, that flies in the face of what the psychiatric mafia wants you to believe. They want you to believe this is a chemical imbalance of your brain. And if you ask them, well, what's the baseline? You know, what, what is out of balance or by how much? They look at you with a blank face. You know, there, there is no objective test to measure any one of those almost 300 diagnoses in the DSM. Mm -hmm. None. There is no test. There is no objective test. They have nothing. No lab work, blood work, EKG, EKGs, nothing. They have no test to validate any of those uh, diagnoses that they have in that, that DSM. And I think that sums everything up perfectly, Jerry. That's a They're great place to leave it. And everything, I think, has been put into perspective. Thanks, Judy. That was really good. 
yeah. great testimony yeah. and a very encouraging and inspirational story. Well, thanks. Agreed. Thanks for having me, Mark.